what do people want right now? And so our, our, we make AI automated email newsletters for some of the biggest thought leaders in the world and uh, smaller brands in over 37 industries. And the secret to our sauce is we're a little bit less worried about the generative output. That's, that's great. We can get that from almost any LLM. We're worried about how good is the machine learning that, that actually learns from what your people are doing and gives them more of what they want. You guys were really, I think, one of, if not the first to do what you're doing. You've maintained a competitive advantage because you're constantly moving and moving very, very quickly. And you've been out raising money. So, you know, now the pressure is really on to scale and grow. Test everything. Because dumb stuff you think wouldn't work might work. And like tried and true, so-called, you know, the golden rules of direct response marketing or any kind of marketing can fall directly flat on their face, primarily because intent is fluid, right? Small team, no team, no time, list of greater than a thousand, you do great work, you're an existing business, you're not just getting started, you're not a solopreneur, um, and you're growth-minded. Like you want to learn and you want to get more data and you want to be better at marketing. We are uh, we could be potentially a fantastic fit for, for you. So I'm here with Joe Stolte. He is the founder of Daily.ai. And uh, you might know Joe because you've met him at Abundance 360, or you know that the automated AI newsletter that Peter Diamandis uses, Dan Sullivan uses, and many, many others uses his platform. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, marketing automation and AI. But um, first of all, is everything that I said accurate so far, Joe? So far, so good. So I think um, uh, I'm going to begin with, I think, the big question, which is um, right now there's an awful lot of AI generated content, marketing content, especially it's creating a lot of noise. How's your platform different? So it's not contributing to the noise, but it's actually creating stuff that's valuable and useful and meaningful. Yeah, I love that question. Great way to drop in. Thanks for having me here. I'll just start with by saying this, like our company's mantra is outcomes over outputs. Like we start most of our meetings talking about that, like that is our main core value, which is to say that who cares if you get a fancy output from AI or from any tool or even a human resource, if it doesn't move the needle and get your business an outcome, the click, the open, the sales call show up, the close, the cash in your bank account. Um, so we're really laser focused on, on outcomes as a starting place. And I think what really helps us differentiate is we were we got in early, you know, because of uh, our act, we got early access to the open AI API way back in like 2021, 2022, back when it was GPT-2. And so we mm -hmm. very quickly made the hypothesis that when this hits the public availability threshold, everybody's going to be making stuff. And I don't think the world necessarily needs more stuff. Although it is incredibly cool to type something into an LLM and get an output text, audio, video. I mean, it's literally amazing. It's much cooler if it gets you an outcome. So from day one, our company was made around the ideas like, how do we get our customers, who we call publishers, outcomes? And the first outcome that we really focused on is how do we get them a better open rate? Because it doesn't really matter if the newsletter that we make for people, whether it's human made or AI made or otherwise, if it doesn't land in the primary inbox and doesn't get an, a, like a genuine open, not a bot click or something filtered out, then it doesn't matter, right? And so first we started focusing on opens, then we just started moving down the funnel. How do we get better clicks? How do we get people to actually convert? And it all comes down to one big idea that we came up with, which is called adaptive learning. Um, I like to think that there's three forms of truth, right? There's what a, a company or a brand thinks the market wants. There's what the market says that they want, and then there's what they actually click on. We want to know all three, but we really over-index on that third one. So every time our machine learning helps a, a publisher or customer on our platform make a newsletter, it's actually learning from every subscriber's previous inter interactions. So it's adapting real time to what people are clicking on and engaging, not necessarily what the brand thinks that they want, although that's important. So it's this really close relationship with kind of what I call intent fluidity, which is, you know, when it, when a subscriber or a prospect or a customer wants to interact, their intent is, is fluid. You know, like the way you felt on September 10th, 2001 was probably different than the way you felt on September 12th, 2001, because something really important happened in the middle. Well, some mini version of that is happening to us all the time, whatever we have at our disposal to figure out, well, what do what do people want right now? 
And so our, our, we make AI automated email newsletters for some of the biggest thought leaders in the world and uh, smaller brands in over 37 industries. And the secret to our sauce is we're a little bit less worried about the generative output. That's, that's great. We can get that from almost any LLM. We're worried about how good is the machine learning that, that actually learns from what your people are doing and gives them more of what they want. Right. And I'm going to back up just a little bit because the first time you and I sat down, it was before ChatGPT, OpenAI was available. There really wasn't a commercial platform. And uh, the big promise was, hey, there's this cool platform where you can effectively train this thing to um, write like you, find articles and content that would be relevant to me so I could basically set up daily AI, pick a bunch of ideas, and it would go out and find content and essentially either repackage it, rewrite it, and build a newsletter engine that someone would subscribe to. And the big benefit was you guys early on could promise and verify that you had really, really high open rates, newsletters that came out every single day, and it just got better and better and better. So it was about the metrics. And I loved that. And so did the big um, players who started using the platform. Um, so let's back up Two step. Well, first of all, anything else that you want to add to that? Because I think that's really what's important is the big promise here is, you know, you guys were really, I think, one of, if not the first to do what you're doing. You've maintained a competitive advantage because you're constantly moving and moving very, very quickly. And you've been out raising money. So, you know, now the pressure is really on to scale and grow. But uh, what did I miss in terms of the, a description of the platform and what makes it important? No, that's it. I mean, you hit the high notes. I think the that's kind of where we're at. That's not necessarily where the puck is going, right? So I'll just give 30 mm -hmm. seconds on, well, where do we go next, right? So mm -hmm. for us, newsletters are were a good way to get in, but that's not where we're going to set up shop. That's not where we're going to make our home. What we're building next is something that we call um, a digital smart response marketing system, which is effectively we're gathering all this data on what your subscribers are clicking on and how they're interacting. And we're piping into almost everyone's CRMs to get data on who's buying, who's not, et cetera. So the future of what we'd like to build is to help people do the same thing, but send personalized messages to get people the right message at the right time over the right channel. Because something like 40% of the content you put in the marketplace actually pushes a prospect away from the sale because it's intrusive, right? We want to help smaller companies. Um, you know, these are companies, let's say, with less than 150 employees be able to, you know, send Mike the message at the right time with the right information with an offer or with not an offer. Maybe it's not time for Mike to get an offer. Maybe we need to hug him a little more before he gets the offer or whatever the promotion is, or maybe not, mm -hmm. right? And so that, that's, that's something that we're super excited about that we're rolling out in about six weeks around the newsletter. And then we're going to expand that off the newsletter and start looking at WhatsApp, SMS, Slack, Discord, owned media channels where you own your relationship with your end uh, prospects or customers or contacts, and uh, you can control how you communicate with them. Good. I love that. That's um, I'm a huge, huge advocate of WhatsApp, especially because it's international, it's universal, and um, it's always been picking up steam with uh, business clients as well. Um, I think that's really, really smart. And you can practically guarantee 100% deliverability, which is, you know, what matters most, right? Um, so let's, I always like to begin with, let's talk about the stuff first and then earn the right to talk about ourselves. So for folks who don't know Joe Stulte, where did he come from? What's your background? What were you doing prior to this? Um, why are you uniquely position to be in charge of and part of daily.ai in this movement. Yeah. By the way, I love that sequencing. I'm going to have to borrow that. Um, I mean, yeah, we can't start talking about you until we've earned a little respect, right? That's the, uh, what's in it for them. Um, yeah, look, uh, my, I started my career in management consulting and, uh, like, like I was, really helping at the intersection of like strategy and marketing for really big, like fortune 100 companies. And, um, but what was cool about that was two things. One, I got access to very, very senior leaders. So I got to see how at the upper echelons of business, how do people move? How do they behave? And number two, 
the budgets and dollars and things that I, you know, we're looking at, we're in the billions. So I was already desensitized to big numbers. Um, but the bad part was that like, that really wasn't my soul's calling, right? It was, it was killing mm-hmm. me a little each day. So uh, yeah, in 2013, I left Microsoft. I moved from Seattle to Venice Beach, California, and I've, I've been a serial entrepreneur ever since. I'm a five-time founder. I've had three successful exits two amazing spectacular failures which as the cliche as it sounds that taught me more than my successes and they really did um and now we're on uh the sixth go-round of the merry-go-round of this tech startup game and so i think um, what's cool about this is that i'm i'm coming to this sixth iteration of joe as tech founder with a lot more wisdom a lot more patience I'm a father now. I, I have a much broader perspective of possibilities, um, mm-hmm. who to partner with, who not, how to put the customer first in a way that's materially uh, moving the ball forward. So, you know, how does that show up for the customer, for someone listening to this? Like, we spend a non trivial amount of time really trying to figure out what our customers say they want and where, where the puck is going so that we could marry up to what's coming. It's kind of that, that old saying, you know, if, if they would have asked, Henry Ford, what to build. If Henry Ford would have asked his people what to build, they would have said a faster horse, but you know, he gave him a car. We're really, really spent a lot of time in this AI world where everything's moving so fast. How do you build what people need and what they want with today's capabilities around what they'll accept, like what they're willing to, to adopt? Because there's things we've been able to do with AI for the last three years that people didn't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. So it's really threading that needle and having the discernment to kind of put all that together in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, it's been really fun, man. I I haven't had this much time to marinate in that part of the business for any other venture that I've been in. And um, I'm realizing that that's um, that's the secret. That's the secret to continue to grow and make. Well, one thing I know about you is you're not eating ramen noodles, so that's good. Um, (laughs) And when I listen to... um, the story, like I feel you, because I've been through the grind also. We have, our, our entrepreneurial journey is very, very similar. Um, and I'm gonna just speak selfishly for a little bit because I think we can get to a destination that our audience wants. So like what I like about daily.ai is this notion of number one, having a newsletter platform that writes for me so I don't have to do it and I don't have to have uh, copywriters constantly studying, keeping up with the latest and greatest, which that's not going to be their job. They're going to want to express themselves and do some artsy stuff, right? That's, you know, like a great copywriter. I think there's more art than there is um, physics and science to, to that process. And the nature of what you guys do is a, is a mix and a blend between those two. Next, doing it daily is really, 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 really hard. It takes a lot of discipline. It's very rare that one person can do that really, really well. Uh, the next, besides just keeping up with all the tech, if that's what you decide to make, have daily AI do for you. Um, the next one is making offers and using some science and some KPIs to do that. So you can decide what to drive. So for example, um, and then you're also doing platformy things, meaning you develop the platform now. And for example, you can cross promote other people's ads between some of your customers. So if Peter Diamandis wants to cross promote Dan Sullivan stuff or Joe Polish's or mine, for example, you can be a gatekeeper there with that person's permission. So you can effectively create cross promotional relationships. That's pretty ideal. Um, Yeah. And when you take that, so let's just put that in a box and say, you've got a really, really cool platform. And in a way, the more customers you have, the stronger it becomes and the bigger moat that you have surrounding yourself. That's awesome. Then you've got the cross channel capabilities, meaning it's not just email, it's other platforms as well. Um, And then look, you're a relationship guy, you're a connection guy, you're innovating all the time. You're gonna be the first to know about something happening and be able to bring that to your customers, all of which are big value. So before I ask you the question that I'm lining up, I just want you to comment 
and thread any of those together if there's something valuable there that you want to stack on top of. No, you did a great job summarizing. That's awesome. I, I think that there's incredible intelligence. Like two of the big things that I think AI brings for us is automation and personalization. And inside of automation, when it comes to email, that's like sub-segmenting, right? So the perfect mm -hmm. sub-segment could go all the way down to one, just personalized communication. But that being said, there's really a lot of wisdom that comes from, you know, we're sending upwards of seven or eight million emails a day now. And every day that's growing exponentially. So, um, but we, you know, for example, when we brought on um, uh, the Robert Kennedy Jr. is um, also a, uh, a customer of ours. It's not an indictment or an endorsement of the man's politics. It's just he's a customer. He's a and guy <laughs> who wants to mail stuff. Good, good. Yeah. He wants to, he wants to engage his people, right, uh, for, for his own benefits. And, um, yeah, and look, like, like he has a massive list. I'm not allowed to say like how many he has, but he has a lot. But something like 18 or 19 percent of his list was already on our platform through our other customers, and so our machine learning already knows when they open, what they like, what they're into. So you get this mm. network effect that if you get, if you have a big enough list and you're in a certain market, there's a good probability that those subs are those subscribers, those humans are reading other kinds of newsletters already on our platform. We start to get this great halo effect of. Well, what are they into? And if you just think about like boring stuff, like warming up emails and deliverability, well, who do you think we're going to send to first? Probably the people that our machine learning knows when they open that they open that they care, you know, and then just build that momentum up. So we're really getting an advantage from a data perspective. And, and it's, that's like really automating all that stuff where a human would have to go in and do it before. It's just, it's boring and it's the back office stuff, but that's actually the difference that makes the difference because if it doesn't land in the damn inbox, you can't see it in the first place, right? So I could keep going. You you hit the high notes. Then we get into the network effects of sharing content, right? So like, you know, whether that's, you know, you or Dan Sullivan or Joe Polish or Chris Foss, you know, you, you guys have a good, like a similar ICP overlap, ideal customer profile overlap. If you make great content, and you're a, like a thought leader or a source that's selected on Joe Polish's newsletter, well, you're, you know, you're, you're going to get shared on his stuff uh, mm -hmm. automatically. And it just creates this really great effect um, where you get to like stand on the shoulders of other giants, including the people that are your peers or contemporaries in a way that's like super collaborative. So um, I, I've always thought that was cool. Like, like the idea of not having to go it alone, just philosophically. And then we try to make that happen with technology in a way where you don't have to know how it works or think about it. It, it just works. And, um, Love it. I love it. So with that in mind, um, I'm curious right now, you've had the great opportunity to have millions of emails leaving daily. You've had years to see how collating and curating content benefits an audience and see the open rates, the clicks, the consistency, and then being able to drop in offers because part of what your engine allows someone to do is drop in offers. And I assume you're optimizing how many offers, how often show up to maximize click throughs. <clears throat> what do you know that most people don't know? What can you share you know, and again, I'm going to be super selfish here. So one of the things that you and I talked about doing is we're going to drop in some of my offers, for example, in the platform, and we're going to give away a book. Oh, um, I've got a certain number of book sales right now. It's stayed um, popular for a bit. And then you've got other types of offers. So some of them are just free information. Um, I'm really curious about like what offers work the best. What are you learning about days and times of open rates and click throughs? What are you learning about, um, uh, mailing in different countries? Um, like what are some of the unique insights that we, that aren't either obvious or normal or your platform is unique you know so that's a huge question but i didn't know how else to encapsulate it you've got unique insights no one else has based upon the volume and the type of stuff you're doing right now yeah um and there's a lot to unpack there the first thing i'll mm -hmm. say and it's like the unanswer to your big question which is like test everything because dumb stuff you think wouldn't work 
might work. And like tried and true, so-called, you know, the golden rules of direct response marketing or any kind of marketing can fall directly flat on their face, primarily because intent is fluid, right? You know, like at the time of this recording, there's like a pretty big dip in the uh, stock market. Who knows how long that will last? People's intent has shifted today. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're a little bit less, less less optimistic. Maybe whatever, whatever your reaction to that is, or maybe you have no reaction to that. So test everything. But that being said, I, I will say there there are a few things that surprise me. Um, the first thing is that the, this idea is not novel, but it's rung true. Is uh, what I've seen across different people's newsletters is you know like the bigger the promise, the bigger the proof. So if you're going to have like a tremendous promise in your in your offer, or your ad, or your we call them in our newsletters conversion cards, then you have to have some way to prove that in the ad to maximize your click through. So we've mm-hmm. actually seen things just that are like you a smaller promise with less copy that where you need to prove it. The burden to prove it is smaller, like mm-hmm. a free book versus you know free access to a course that's going to give this big thing, right? Like that does. There's a disconnect there. I don't. I don't mm-hmm. understand the psychology. I'm just observing the, what's happening. So something like a free book is a slam dunk in a lot of our publishers' newsletters. It's easy to understand if it's topically relevant and the person's intent is lined up. Bam, you just, it works. It works very, very well. Welcome to the world of three second attention spans and fewer than 20 seconds to get a prospect's attention, engage them, get to know, like, and trust you and say, I want and need what you have. Let's make a deal. Now, introducing Digital Cafe AI, a relationship building AI that will take your hard earned leads and make them feel like you're sitting down with them for a cup of coffee, listening to their needs and responding to them with a personalized, useful, resourceful solution. It's the perfect AI team. A Digital Cafe AI does hours or days of work that normally requires an expensive team of specialists in minutes. It's the fastest, easiest, automated way to get attention, engagement, and trust to close bigger deals faster. A Digital Cafe AI is a done-for-you service that can be adapted to any B2B or B2C business. Money loves speed and time kills deals. So visit Digital Cafe AI to see how it will work for you. Well, um, the second thing is I thought that if we put, you know, let's say like more than one ad in the newsletter, that the second ad just wouldn't get any click through. And I was totally wrong about that. I mean, the click through is about a third. So we, our newsletters look like news feed. That's like three or four thumb scrolls of content. If you can imagine like Instagram in the inbox. Mm-hmm. What we found is the best position to place an ad is the second card. So there's an intro to the newsletter, a card that opens it up, and then a second. Then the second card is typically the gets the best clicks, like let's say nine times out of ten. But if you place a second card at the bottom, let's say the second card from the bottom, that card might get anywhere from like one sixth to one third the clicks, but the quality of those clicks is much higher. Why? Because you're getting someone that's taking the time to scroll to the bottom of your newsletter. That arguably Mm. that person is more engaged. So the numbers are smaller, but the throughput is typically of a higher quality. Now I'm caveating because I don't know, man, test everything. Everybody's situation is different. But those are the couple of things that surprise me. Um, Time of day, like no rhyme or reason except try to avoid Friday for important stuff. That rule hasn't seemed to change. Like if for people that mail daily, Fridays seem to be the day that has the biggest hit. So you know, if you want to mail something that you don't want people to pay attention to, Friday is a good day for that. Um, try to, um, and this is not universally true, but if you have a broad international audience, like like four to seven a.m. Eastern has, is kind of a good time to hit lots of time zones. Um, but that shouldn't be rocket surgery. It's just time zone mm-hmm. when, when people are awake. Um, other than that, I have not seen any strong data from our platform on, oh, send at this time. Um, but it's really easy to tell when to send for your audience. And our platform does that mm-hmm. automatically, right? So it'll, in some cases, test send or if you're sending daily, it just watches when the... It does. That's great. That's great. So I... Uh, that is really, really great insights. And... Um, so what I'm really hearing, your first point about the smallest amount of proof required to give away a book really just tells us how trust is at an all-time premium. Probably cynicism is at an all-time uh, premium right now. So 
you're looking for friction-free yeses, um, which is not news. It's not new, but I think it's it's one of those things that you've got to prioritize and say, okay, I think you need to have a friction-free checklist and think about, okay, let's just make sure there's nothing here. Um, and then this uh, this notion and and just listening to you right now again I was I, as I was listening to you going okay how can I use this well for example one of the things that we've talked about is um, you know inside I want to give away our AI book because it's an AI newsletter platform right it's like let's just see how many clicks and how many completions we get that'll be great info for both of us but what if like I've got three other books okay. Um, so I've got your next act referral party, and then my sales book. So my next highest value giveaway is your next act, which is basically reinvent yourself. That's the theme. I would love to do a test. If we were going to do a, a test is the AI book would be the top one because it's topically relevant and has the least amount of trust to overcome. It's like a free AI book. You can't go wrong. And I know it already sells well, but if the second offer would be to reinvent yourself based upon that, even if the clicks are a sixth or a third, if they're higher quality clicks, it means, you know, if that message resonates right away, reinvent yourself, um, I'd be super curious what would happen there. And if we have an aggregate, meaning, you know, how many clicks, how many opt-ins do you get on a volume basis, that becomes a baseline. And, you know, as a marketer, it, you know, and again, I was, I was using a selfish application first because that's where the op world I operate in, but I'm going to know exactly what, the clicks, the opens, the opt-ins are going to be, and I'll know the value. And over time, I'd have a series of offers going out, let's say over the next 30 days. There's a lot of opportunities to touch. So when you hear that, you as a marketer with the benefit of lots of data, you've got a lot of experimentation you've done. You can look at big data. What other ideas or assumptions show up to you when we're speaking to other business owners here on how to think about marketing, how to earn trust, how to do some testing? Like what else would you do? Yeah. Well, I think what we try to optimize for in our business is this, like if you've heard of the 7-Eleven four rule, you know, Google did a study some years ago that basically showed to take a cold prospect all the way to a cash conversion. It takes something like seven hours of interaction across 11 touch points on four different platforms. And so what we really try to do is we, we, we try to get up that curve as fast as we can. So I do lots of podcasts that, that helps hit up the interactions or the seven hours of them hearing from us. We obviously send daily newsletters that hits the 11 interactions pretty quickly. And then we try to go across a bunch of different platforms. So in your case, Right, like email is awesome. It has more daily active users than any so single social media platform. And why, you know, let's get everything we can from everything we've got, as our friend Jay Abraham says. Right. So if they click your book ad, either of them, then let's pixel them and let's retarget them with the low budget Facebook ads. Boom. Now we can get them on Facebook. We can get them on WhatsApp. We can get them on Instagram. Right now, that's our four platforms. Then mm -hmm. let's do the same thing on Google if we can. Right. So now I'm kind of following you around. Also, then let's also follow up with email. So if they hit the page and subscribe, like you get the email, obviously you want to follow up with them. Um, so we want to kind of wrap them around what I call the halo effect through different touch points across different ecosystems and do that in an automated capacity. Because as much as I love our platform and I love, let's say that the large language learning models, the most powerful AI that we all have access to right now is the ad platforms. It's the longest running, oldest tested, most powerful way to reach people. So yeah, that would be my recommendation is like, let's get all the leverage we can from all the AI that we have our access to um, by following them around with, with basic retargeting. Um, now I would yeah. change that if the scenario was a little bit different, but since we're giving away books it, like, or, or trying to get people to buy books, low lift. You don't need seven hours in the cockpit with them to get a book, but we do need some yeah. meaningful amount of touch points. So that's my paradigm. It's how do we think about the 7-Eleven four-room rule, whether it's an exact science or directionally correct, and try to get at people and get love on them and give them value um, across 
different platforms to, to get up that. Right. That all, all that makes a ton of sense. Um, which really gets back to lots of channels and I, and the stat that you rattled off was seven and a half hours, 11 I think it's seven engagements. hours of, of like, it doesn't have to be consecutive, but a seven hours of exposure, 11 okay, touch points hours. across four mm -hmm. platforms. So a platform could be Mike and I bump into each other at a conference. That's in person. Yeah. Then we okay. jump on a Zoom call. Then he gets an email from me and then he sees my Facebook retard. That, that's the that's four channels. So channels are broad. Um, and then 11 touch points is 11 touch points, right? I don't, I don't know how deep or how wide they need to be. But for us, we send daily newsletters. You subscribe. We, we have an average of 40 to 60% open rates. You get the 11 touches on email pretty quickly. Um, and then seven hours is like, cool. Well, how do we get seven hours of interaction with them? It depends on your sales cycle. I mean, you, they may watch a webinar and you get 30 or 45 minutes. They may read your book. Bam, there's the rest of your seven hours if they finish it. Or they may come in and have a, like a, like a web or they may come to a, an event or there's lots mm -hmm. of ways to get up that curb. I just love podcasting because if I'm doing a good job of keeping people's attention, we're creating value. I'm getting that seven hours chipped down 45 minutes to 60 minutes at a time. Um, so having your own podcast is extraordinarily powerful. So is just being on other people's platforms. I like, I don't have my own podcast. I just stand on the other shoulder of other people like you. Thank you. Um, yeah. you have an audience, you have a podcast and, um, I can go get on a bunch of people's podcasts and get up that curve. Fairly. Yeah. And I would also suggest in this particular case, um, this is not to toot my horn. It's just to align with what you're saying. My audience are primarily you know, because this is the podcast I do with Dan Sullivan, this is Strategic Coach, it's Genius Network, it's Abundance 360, it's EO, YPO. I have your perfect ideal audience watching, listening to this, and it's multi-channel. Um, and now we're breaking everything up into little chunks. We've been using Opus to um, break all of our podcast episodes into little chunks and then hit Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Shorts, I never, I don't have TikTok on my, on any of my devices, but someone else who works for me does. So it's getting out there on as many right. platforms as we can. Right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, and that I would say is, is perfect. So that's, that's fantastic. And, and the fact that I assume on your platform, you have, um, all of the bugs, all of the pixel data that gets loaded up. So if someone's opening up your newsletter, um, you know, I'll be able to start following them around um, on all of the different sites and buying ads as well. So um, like for our platform that are worth calling out, first of all, anything that that takes them out of the newsletter and into your ecosystem, if it's pixel, you're going to get followed around. We get a tremendous amount of data from email as a channel. We get a lot more from places like WhatsApp and these other channels. And mm -hmm. what's important is that I can send you, or rather you can send yourself, you can just go filter who are my most engaged subscribers over the last X days or Y editions. Bam, export, look the like list, please uh, other, you know, Google and Meta, go, go find these people and give me more of them. So like there's lots of tricks that you can, you know, use to see, hey, based on how people are engaging and raising their hand with their attention to me right now, have they bought the widget and should I sell them more? Or what should my next best step be for my most engaged people right now? That's an important question to ask all the time, whether you're using us or not. We just happen to make it really easy to send you lists of people that are super engaged so that you can take them into your ecosystem and really get value out of them. Awesome. So <clears throat> I have one more core question on uh, with regards to the platform. Let's say I've been mailing and I know who my biggest openers are, my biggest clickers, the most likely to respond, can I do sub, can I basically create a sub list out of our, my most active and just send specialized newsletters to them through your platform? Yeah, today, no. By September, end of September, yes. And the reason why is because we started off our platform sending individual newsletters to every subscriber. And mm -hmm. earlier I was talking about how sometimes what people are willing to accept is 
there's a gap between that and what's possible. So um, we rolled that back as too many publishers were like, well, I don't trust AI to send it to individuals. Now everyone's begging us for it. So we're rolling that back out. So it's like, I can personalize the newsletter so that Mike has a little section. that's like Mike's picks just for you, what you mm-hmm. click on. Um, we can send a, a, a bit of the newsletter. We can send a call to action. We can send broadcast emails. You can do all kinds of fun stuff based on how people have interacted with your newsletter. And we can do that automatically. So that you don't have to do any of that. It'll just say, okay, when this behavior happens, send personalized messages under these circumstances and it'll just take care of it. And it will personalize it in a way that's like writing to you based on what you've clicked on. One of one segmentation, not, you know, like little small groups. It's like, you know, very personalized at the time that Mike's most likely to open it. Okay. So I think this is a great um, moment to bring everyone home. So I, I want to, if I were to grant you <clears throat> the benefit of handing you the perfect customer who's a right fit for daily AI, who you know would get the most benefit from it. Um, who are they? Let's just roll that perfect, perfect client or customer who them getting involved, signing up, being able to get configured, which does not take a lot of time. It's relatively simple. You've got your own onboarding built in. Um, who's a perfect fit for daily.ai right now? Yeah. I mean, if you've got a list of more than a thousand people, which is a really important number, and you do really good work in the marketplace, meaning like you've got an existing product or service that makes money and adds real value to people. Um, and you don't have a lot of time or you don't have a lot of team to do this on your own, then you're probably our perfect customer. You know, we, if you've got a team, let's, let's say more than a hundred people, not our perfect customer, because you could probably do a lot of this on your own. There's a lot of decision makers. You, it, it ends up being a, a game of, uh, you know, opinions, whereas like, and the human wants to get involved. But if you're what I described, let's say, you know, team, small team, no team, no time, list of greater than a thousand, you do great work, you're an existing business, you're not just getting started, you're not a solopreneur, um, and you're growth minded, like you want to learn and you want to get more data and you want to be better at marketing, we are, uh, could be potentially a fantastic fit for for you. If you're mailing a newsletter already, even better. If you're not, that's all good. But th- those things have to be in place. And the last one is you got to want to send a newsletter. Otherwise, um, probably not a good fit for you. How about content? Are there content categories that this is not appropriate for? And who would be the best? Yeah. Well, luckily, our, our the thing we use to, to, to do all this stuff, we call it the perspective engine. It scrapes you know up to 3 million pieces of content a day. So there's a, nearly no niche. If, if there's content being produced on the internet that you think your audience would be interested in, we can find it, package it, and send it to your people and watch what they click on. If you are the kind of brand that's like, no, I need to tighten the aperture of everything to the point where it's like, it's got to have this exact brand thing and this exact brand voice and this, 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 like you're putting a lot of like human subjectivity into it, then we're probably not a good fit, which isn't to say that isn't the right way to look at the world. It's just, we aren't a good fit for you. We're using data to figure out the customer wants. Like we're over-indexing on the click, not on what you think is best. And so uh, we try to marry them up. But if that's you and it's like, you know, hey, uh, that's your, that's your jam, then they're probably not a good fit for us. The other one is if it's like, you believe that truth is only arrived at through peer-reviewed scientific journals. There probably isn't enough content that you'd be proud to publish to your audience. We've run into that a handful of times where it's like, no, that's not mm-hmm. accurate or that's not real or true. Well, that you know, that's a pretty, for better or for worse, a very narrow way to look at truth. So we, 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 you know, there's not enough content for us to give you there. Otherwise, if you don't fit in those camps, we we're fairly we we crush it. Like if you really. And if you just want to give great content to your audience, you know, some people are like, like they have a little bit of a scarcity mindset and they're like, no, I I don't want to send this person or that person. What if they go buy their stuff and like that kind of a mentality, then we're probably not Mm -hmm. a good fit because we're, 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 we're curating third party content, very good third party content. So if that's your mindset, then you're probably not a good fit. But if that does not apply to you, you want to love your customers, you want to send them content that they'd be deeply interested in and then give them offers that capitalize on that interest, then we're we're worth having a check. Uh, I love it. Well, here's what we'll do. I'll make sure that there are links in show notes. Uh, there may be a special link in here, but for right now, head on over to daily.ai. You'll be able to sign up and see some of the stuff that Dan Sullivan, Peter Diamandis, Joe Polish, lots of other 
amazing people are using daily.ai for and learn a little bit more about Joe. And um, Joe's a guy you can trust. I like him. He's always got great insights. And no matter what, whether it's this or his next venture, make sure you follow him. So anything else you want to add before we uh, send people on their way, Joe? Oh, that's it. Thanks for having me, Mike. You got it. Thanks, brother. <laughs>